Hey everybody, welcome to The Trench. My name is Christian and... Hey everybody, this is Steve and one of the things I do with friends like Christian is eat. A lot. I'll be hanging out with a friend and suddenly get a craving for food. Maybe chicken wings or a hamburger or pizza. Something yummy and not very good for me. Yet I notice something about those cravings. The more I give in to them, the stronger they get. The more I eat hamburgers, the more I seem to want hamburgers. The more I give in to cravings, the more those cravings seem to strengthen. And there's a short little saying that seems to capture why this happens. You are what you eat. I've heard this phrase millions of times over the years. Trainers and doctors remind you to eat a sensible diet because, after all, you are what you eat. And you don't really want to be a weird amalgam of Twinkies, Bratwurst, and antacid, right? Yet you also find this line in the most surprising of places, at the beginning of Father Alexander Schmemann's For the Life of the World. Father Schmemann saw that lots of people really do think that we are nothing more than what we eat, that there's nothing besides the physical world, that we are nothing more than a collection of atoms and molecules bouncing around in space. On the other hand, some of us respond to this materialist vision with a religious vision. We push back against the secular vision by emphasizing religious spaces, religious rituals, by insisting that sacred things are the antidote to secular things. Yet as Steve has talked about before, there is no divide between the sacred and the secular. And Father Schmemann helps us understand this through something that we all do, and probably that we all take for granted, eating. Father Schmemann notes that the Adam and Eve we encounter in the book of Genesis are two hungry beings, and God gave them dominion over the whole world with a blessing to eat and drink as they needed. But eating wasn't supposed to be some utilitarian way to make sure they have enough fuel, enough calories to burn while they sunbathed? In the garden? What did they, what did they do in the garden? Rather, eating is actually a profoundly mystical act, an act where we commune with God by taking the world into us and making it a part of us. It's a way we exercise our own care and stewardship over creation and why eating continues to have such a sacramental nature. It's something Steve and I explored in one of the episodes of our podcast, Pop Culture Coffee Hour. The link's down in the doobly-doo. Dude, do I have to say doobly-doo? Yes. <sighs> doobly-doo. Yet, despite the blessed quality of food, Adam and Eve first sinned through food. They ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, preferring to become like God without God, as we discussed back in episode 66. Food became a means of death and disconnection rather than life and eternal communion with our Heavenly Father, which is why it's so amazing that Christ offers us reconciliation through food. A few weeks ago, Steve did an episode on the sacraments, or as we prefer to say in the church, the mysteries. And he explained that we don't have seven mysteries, but rather one mystery, Holy Communion. This is where Christ invites us to literally eat his body and drink his blood, where he lays himself on the altar and invites us to taste and see that he, the Lord, is good. Where he invites us to true life, not what we mistakenly assume is life. Because here's the crazy thing, by ourselves, we aren't really alive. We think of food as the source of our life because without it, we'll die. Yet the church realizes that food itself is dead. We eat dead animals and dead plants, things that offer temporary calories and temporary nutrients that will be used up. We may eat and feel satisfied for a little while, but we'll inevitably feel hungry again. We'll inevitably need food again because food doesn't really offer us life. It offers us survival giving us the illusion of life for a few more days or hours. When we eat food, which is this imperfect thing, we simply digest it and bring it into our imperfect bodies. Our meals and snacks become our blood and bones, the stuff that makes up our mortal bodies. Nowhere are we really receiving life. It's just limited mortal stuff added to our already limited mortal existence. But that's not how Holy Communion works. St. Nicholas Gavasilas, the great church father and theologian, reflects on Christ and our union with him in his classic book, The Life in Christ. If you're ready for it, it can be a powerful and uplifting read. He observes that when we eat food, we turn that food into us. We bring it into our lives. Yet when we eat Holy Communion, when we eat Christ's body and blood, the reverse happens. We don't transform his body into our body, Instead, we are transformed into His body. Unlike normal food, Holy Communion doesn't merely cement us deeper in this broken version of ourselves, trapped in an endless cycle of sin and death. 
It frees us to be who God made us to be, living human beings united to Christ, the true human being. And this is why it's so important that we receive Holy Communion as often as we can, every Sunday if possible, though that's something that we should talk about with a spiritual father. As St. Nicholas wrote, while we were dead, it was impossible to offer homage to the living God. But unless we constantly feast at the banquet, it is impossible to be alive. And this is really the beautiful arc of the entire story of salvation. Humanity begins in the garden, hungry for something, and we are finally satisfied at the Lord's table in the Lord's kingdom. As Christ says again and again, the kingdom is a heavenly marriage feast celebrating our union with Christ celebrating the salvation and the life of the world. Though we were created hungry, in Christ we are finally filled. So there you have it. You are what you eat. And when we accept Christ's invitation to eat his body and drink his blood in Holy Communion, we become members of his body. This, in a mystical sense, changes our nature from a broken, false humanity to a true, whole, healed, Humanity in Christ. More on that next time. So let's be the bee and allow what we consume to shape who we are. Be the bee and live orthodoxy. Remember to like and subscribe and share. I'll see you all next week. Thanks to our supporters on Patreon who helped make this episode possible. To support the creation of more Orthodox Christian content, please visit patreon.com slash y2am.